morning. Good morning. It is good to see each of you here this morning. I know again that the weather is not not that great, not that terrible either, but it is cold and of course again the roads are not not in great shape with the snow and ice and such and so we do encourage you all to be careful as you are traveling we would want you to, to be safe uh, traveling back and forth if you will bow with me as we go to God in prayer <clears throat> our most gracious righteous heavenly father we humbly bow before you in prayer we praise you exalt you we thank you father for all that you have done for us father we pray that all that we do this morning will be pleasing to you. It will be in accordance with your will, Father. We pray uh, that you will forgive us of any sins that we have in our lives that would hinder our worship of you, Father. Father, we pray uh, that as we study your word, we are thankful for your word, Father. We pray that we will be diligent in our studies, that we will apply these things to our lives, and that we will live accordingly always seeking to serve you, Father. In Christ's most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You will open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus in chapter 3 and chapter 4. We see here in, as in Exodus chapters 3 and 4 an example that we can learn much from. An example that I know you are familiar with and one that we need to consider uh, and make certain that we are not falling into the same situation that Moses here falls into. We know, of course, Moses has departed from Egypt and he would become, instead of a prince, he would become a shepherd. And he spent some time in being a shepherd and here we see that he is about to enter into the third phase of his life, if you will. Looking in verse 1 of Exodus 3, we read, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, I can't speak for you, brothers and sisters, but I can say for a certainty that if I was out shepherding sheep or whatever I might be doing, and I looked, and behold, there's a bush over here burning, and yet it isn't consumed. That'd get my attention. I can assure you of that. That would, that would get my full attention. What's going on here? How is it that this bush is on fire, and yet it isn't consumed? It isn't burnt up. And Moses was kind of, I suppose, we're not told his exact thoughts here, but he was perhaps thinking that very thing. What's going on here? And he decides to go and investigate. And of course we are aware that it says that, that he goes and he, he, he's investigating and then we see that the Lord, verse 4, saw that he turned aside to see God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he tells him to take his shoes off because he's on holy ground. And then just to give us an idea of what's going on here, he tells him that he has heard his people down in Egypt. They have cried out, wanting deliverance, and he's about to deliver them. And guess what, Moses? I've chosen you to go do it. I'm going to deliver them with a mighty hand, and yet, Moses, I'm going to use you to do it. And brothers and sisters, we see, beginning in verse 11, that Moses does what far too often you and I do in serving God. He starts to make 
excuses. Starts to offer reasons why certainly it is not he that should be doing this. We look down in verse 11 and we read, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? He says. In effect, the idea here that Moses is presenting is, Lord, I'm nobody. I'm not worthy to be to be used, Lord. You can surely find someone else that would be a better example as to uh, doing this, a better servant to go and deliver the people, right? Isn't that what he's in effect saying? Brothers and sisters, you and I too often get that same idea. And perhaps there's a right humility in, in Moses in saying this. Perhaps to some extent we can all be humble. And we are taught to be so, aren't we? We're taught not to exalt ourselves uh, as we were coming out of the, the office in here this morning, uh, Bill Stokes made the comment, he who would be first shall be last. And he was, he was talking about, of course, that he was the last one out and, and just making a, a note there. But brothers and sisters, there's a truth to that, is there not? Are we not taught to be humble, not to put ourselves ahead of others? So maybe we give the benefit of the doubt to Moses. That's what he was thinking. He just, uh, Lord, surely there's someone else better than me. I'm humble, right? <coughs> brothers and sisters, but the truth of the matter is we too often use that as an excuse as why not to do what we can do. Holding your... Uh, place here, turn with me to the book of Mark. And we find that the Lord does not always choose those who we might think as being the best person, the most fit person for the job, right? And the reason for that is that God does not see as you and I see. Think of the kings of Israel. The first king King Saul, how was he described? He was head and shoulder above everybody else. He was a tall, good-looking young man. He was, he was the kind of guy that you would look to in order to uh, expect to be the leader, right? And in truth, that's... And, there is scientific evidence to back this up that most of the time, who do we look to in order to be the leaders? We look for the person who is taller. So those of you who are taller, you are going to likely be viewed as the leader. <clears throat> but height doesn't necessarily make us good leaders, does it? And God does not look at our looks he does not look at our, our height and such. <coughs> Excuse me. In order to view that, for after all, David wasn't under that same mold, was he? And yet he was a man after God's own heart. And what about his disciples, his apostles? Here in Mark, we begin to see that Jesus calls his apostles. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 17, this of course is in context, God has, or Christ has come and He is preaching, uh, verse 14, and then He begins to call his, his apostles. Verse 17, and Jesus, well, we'll back up to verse 16. Now, as He walked by the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and Andrew, His brother, casting a net, into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And in verse 20, And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants, and, after, and went after them. Talking, of course, about John and James. 
verse 19, the sons of Zebedee. So here, four of his apostles he's called. And what are they? Are they some prince over here? Are they great, greatly educated men who have gone to school for years and studied uh, and, and learned so much? No, that's not the men they're calling. They're fishers. Brothers and sisters, how many of us, when we start thinking about our leaders, we just had an election for various offices, and how many of us would go out here and uh, walk beside some lake and see someone out here fishing and thinking, well, there goes the guy we need to be president. He's a fisherman. We would think like that, wouldn't we? And yet that's exactly what Jesus here is doing. He is selecting those who are not what we would normally think. Look in chapter 2. And we see in verse 14 of Mark. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of customs, and said unto him, Follow me. What is, what is Levi? Matthew, as we know him. He's a tax collector, right? Jesus, if you go down and look at his, his apostles, these men are not the ones that we might think of as the greatest to be chosen. And in all and in many cases, they might not exactly get along. One of them was a tax collector, and the other one was sworn to basically kill all tax collectors. Brothers and sisters, Moses here in Exodus chapter 3 asks the question, who am I? Perhaps we might view that as simply being humbled. Maybe there was a level of humility there. But the truth of the matter is God doesn't necessarily select those that we might think. Moses is now 80 years old. He's out shepherding sheep. Just 40 years earlier, he had been in great power, right? Or, or been looking at uh, possibly doing so. He was brought up in the house of Pharaoh. He was brought up a prince. And in fact, it is believed that he thought that he was going to deliver them now. Then, at that point, he kills the man. And he thinks that they're all going to just come flop behind him and... They'll follow him. After all, look at where he's been. He's been a prince. He's, he's fighting for them now. And yet, is that the attitude that was presented? They didn't want him at that time, did they? He wasn't prepared at that time to lead. And the Lord could see, brothers and sisters, he could see to whom he was speaking here. He could see Moses and know when he was ready. And we see in verse 12, And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? And what and what shall I say unto them? So, here in verses 12 and 13, we see in verse 12 what? God says, I'm with you. Paul would say, If God be for us, who can be against you? Brothers and sisters, as long as we have God, we don't have to worry, do we? <clears throat> if God sends us, if God tells us to do something, do we have to be worried about whether or not we can carry it out? God knows who we are, does He not? But Moses isn't satisfied with this, is he? 
In verse 11, he says, who am I? Verse 13, we find, what does he say? Who are you? That's effectively what he's saying there. Who do I tell who you are? They're going to want to know who you are, God. And God, verse 14, said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. God has sent you to them. We worry sometimes, don't we? First we begin to say, well, who am I? Surely there's somebody better, right? Somebody better that can go do the job that needs to get done. But then we might say, well, who do I tell them that sent me? Who do I say God is? Who do I tell them God is? Brothers and sisters, if you were speaking to someone out in the world, who would you tell them God is? Would you tell them that He is the God of creation? You see in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 that God created the heavens and the earth. And we read how, of course there in verse 1, we're told He created the heavens and the earth, and then we are told in the remainder of that chapter, and in chapter 2 more specifically, in more detail about uh, the creation of man, we're told of how He created everything. Could you tell them that? You might say, well, Robert, I don't know about all these things. I don't understand. I, I don't know where the everything about the Bible. But could you tell them he's the God of creation? And point them to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Could you tell them that he is a God of the Bible? The God that is spoken of in the first chapter of the book. That is mentioned in the very first verse of the book of the Bible. And then he is discussed in the last chapter of the book of the Bible. And brothers and sisters, he is discussed throughout. Could you tell them that he is the God who delivers his people... Here we see that he is preparing to do just that with the Israelites, right? But brothers and sisters, can you tell people that he delivers us today? That he delivers those who would obey the gospel, those who would be saved, that he has provided the means by which they can be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 and verse 16. We might say, well, I can't go do this because I don't know what to tell them about who he is. Brothers and sisters, we have all sorts of information here about God and who he is. And he has told us who he is. And he says here who he is. I am that I am, he said. And then he goes on in verse 15, And God said moreover unto Moses, thou shalt, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and if Jacob appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, even that, visited you, and seen that which is done unto, done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, unto the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Am Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is the God of the living, brothers and sisters. 
He is our God. And can we tell people who He is? And yet so often we find people who spend their time making excuses. But God is with Moses. And He tells them that he's going, they're going to listen to Him. And then in verse 1 of chapter 4, we read, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Who am I, Lord? Okay, so that's who I am. Well, who are you? Okay, we've got that down. But they're not going to believe me when I go and tell them all these things, Lord. They're not going to believe me. Brothers and sisters, do you ever feel that people just simply don't believe it when you teach them, when you try to tell them about God, when you try to tell them about Christ, about what He has done for you, that they don't believe you? The truth of the matter is, so often, they don't believe you, brothers and sisters. But is that what we need to be worried about? that they're not going to believe us? We see in 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you hold your place here and turn with me there to 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see how that the people do what? They ask for a king. Give us a king, Samuel, that we may be like other nations, that he may judge us as other nations. We want to be like all these other people with a king. Verse 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 8. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Samuel was upset about this. This isn't right. But notice what God says. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not... <coughs> For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Samuel, give them what they want. It's not you they're rejecting, it's me. Brothers and sisters, you may spend your life telling other people about Christ. Pleading with them, perhaps loved ones, perhaps family or friends. You plead with them to hear. You plead with them to believe and to obey. And yet they reject that truth. They reject the Word of God. It's not you they're rejecting. They're rejecting God. We need to understand, God doesn't tell me, and He doesn't tell you, that we have to go out and force other people to obey God's Word. What did, what did God tell? We were talking about in Bible class this morning, of course we've been going through Ezra. We're in there in Ezra chapter 9, and, and of course Ezra chapters 9 and 10 dealing with what are the people, both the rulers and the common people, if you will. What are they doing? They're, they're caught up in marriages they were told not to be involved in, right? They were, they were told, don't go marry amongst these people. Don't get caught up in their sins. And yet... What do they do? They go get caught up in, in these sins, right? <coughs> and, brothers and sisters, what did God, in fact, told them to do to all these people? He told them to kill them, right? I think I heard somebody say that. He told them to kill them. 
Kill them all. Run them out, at least. Get rid of them, right? Destroy these people. They were told to conquer with a sword, brothers and sisters. What about you and I? Are we told to conquer with a sword? No. Look in Isaiah chapter 2, in verses 2 through 4. And this is a text that too many get caught up with in, in saying, well, see, this hasn't happened. It has. Isaiah 2, 2 through 4 is prophesying of the establishment of the church. But this hasn't happened because people are still fighting wars and they're not getting what it's teaching here. They don't understand. They're, they're missing the point of what the Lord here is saying. Isaiah 2, beginning with verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow in unto it and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and, he will, and we will walk in... His path for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And then notice in verse 4. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Well see you can't have this have been fulfilled because there's still war right? I know there are members of this congregation and there are people here today who have fought, who have served and fought in wars. And so this couldn't have happened. But brothers and sisters, what is he talking about here? Under the old system, he had told his people, the Israelites, to go in and to conquer, to destroy these people using what? Swords. And of course, he did so in other ways as well. But they were told to go in and conquer. What about you and I? Do we take out weapons? Guns today. We have guns and other technology. Do we take those technology, that technology and go out to force people to obey the gospel? No, we don't. We don't, do we? We use what? We use the Word of God, don't we? We need to understand. We see in Matthew 13. We're not going to read the text here. We see the parable of the sower, if you will. What is he doing? He's out sowing the seed. And brothers and sisters, that is what, and that is what is being taught there. That is what Isaiah is talking about. How do we quote unquote conquer? How do we bring people, convert them to the truth? Through this through the seed, through the Word of God. God tells me to go out and sow the seed. He doesn't say that I am responsible for what comes up. I am to warn, as Ezekiel 3 and chapter 33 as well teaches. You are to warn. You are to spread the seed. And there are those who will not believe what you teach them. What you try to teach them at least. There are those who may believe, but they still don't wish to obey. Remember this. Many rejected Christ in His day. And many today will reject the truth and not obey. But it isn't our responsibility if they don't obey. And Moses here says they, they, they're not, they're not going to believe me, God. They're not going to believe that you appear to me. 4 and verse 2, And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he tells him to cast it down, and what happens? A serpent, right? He tells him to take his hand and put it his bosom. Pull it out. What's happened to it? It's become leprous. Why the snow? Put it back. He does. Pull it out again. And he's healed. 
Now we understand that God doesn't give us this miraculous today. I know there's those who say that he does, but the word of God teaches that those things have ceased. As Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 13. But he does give us the word, and you and I can take it out and share it with others. Brothers and sisters, there's many who will reject this, but that does not excuse us from trying. We see in verse 10 of Exodus 4, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech, and of a slow tongue. I'm not a very good speaker, Lord. Perhaps he's saying here, I'm not all that bright, Lord. I'm not the top of the class, if you will. Do you ever feel like that, brothers and sisters? I'm not the best speaker. Surely there's somebody else. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You don't have to be. You don't have to be the best speaker. Now, you do need to know this. If you don't know this, you need to pick it up and study it. You need to become familiar with it. You need to be able to share it with others. You need to know what it teaches. You don't want to go tonight to teach somebody something if you yourself don't know. But that, of course, I'm not saying if you don't know, just give up and don't ever do. But get where you do know. <coughs> but brothers and sisters, I submit to you that if, if we waited on the most eloquent speaker, the smartest people. There wouldn't be very many preachers preaching the Word of God. You know, I've had people over the years who have told me I was a good preacher. I've had others who have told me that in a roundabout way I didn't mount much. Wasn't a very good speaker. And I figure, brothers and sisters, that I'm not the worst preacher in the world. And I figure I'm not the best. I'm somewhere in between. Now you may feel different. You may feel I'm on one end or the other. And that's, everyone gets to make up their own mind on what they think. But brothers and sisters, the truth is, if we spend our time worrying about that we're not the most eloquent of speakers, we're not... You know, we're not the most glib, if you will. We can't speak as well as others do. Then we will never get anything accomplished. Keep in mind, who did Jesus go and pick out? Did he go over here and go find the, the most eloquent speakers? Now we think about Paul. And Paul was highly educated for his day. He learned at the feet of Gamaliel, a highly respected Jewish teacher. But what about his other apostles? They weren't all so highly educated, were they? Again, four of them were fishermen. Now, that's not to say that if you go fishing that you can't be smart. But it wasn't about their education. It wasn't about their fluency with the language. You see, Jesus had prayed before he went and selected them. He wasn't looking at their looks. He wasn't looking at their education. He saw something else in them. And brothers and sisters, we need to understand that. And we need to recognize that we don't have to be the most highly educated. We need to understand that God says to do these things. He tells us to serve. And we need to trust in Him. Here in verse 10 of chapter 4, Moses offers this idea. Now, I'm, not, I'm not that eloquent. Lord. What, did, what did God say? Did God say, you're, well, Moses, you're right. You're not. So eh, just forget about it. It's not His attitude, is it? And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf? Or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Moses, I made you. 
I know what your abilities are. He knew that before he called Moses, did he not? He knew what Moses was capable of doing. He didn't need Moses to say, Lord, I'm not very good at this. I, I'm not the smartest one. I'm not the best speaker. He didn't need him telling him that. He already knew it. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And ultimately, what did he do? He told him he would send Aaron, who was a good speaker. And he will use him. Now, does Moses just at this point just jump and say, Lord, you're right. I, I, I asked who, who I am. Okay, you set me straight on that. I asked who you are. I, I, you told me who you are. I, I said they won't believe me. Okay, well, you've given me reasons, you know, ways to show them that what I am saying, keep in mind, Mark 16 and verse 20, that's exactly what the miraculous was for. You've given me these miraculous abilities that they may believe that you, in fact, have appeared to me and sent me. You've taken care of that. You pointed out that you're aware that I'm not the best speaker. Does Moses just say, okay, I've got it. You, you're right. Here I go. He doesn't, does he? What does he say in verse 13? We read, And he said, O my Lord, send I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Now, is Moses here saying, Lord, you're right. Send, send by the hand you choose, and you've chosen me. Is that what he's saying here? It's not. What he's saying is, Lord, send somebody else. Moses, Moses has heard all of this, he has seen all of this, and yet his answer, his reply to God is still, Lord, go pick somebody else. Brothers and sisters, you and I today, so often, what do we do? We do just what Moses is doing here. We may say, uh, you know, studying uh, Moses, shame on him. He sees the burning bush, he hears God speaking to him, from the bush. He sees these signs. God is telling him all this. God has assured him he is going to be with him. And surely Moses should have, should have realized and should have just gone and done what he told him to do. Shame on Moses. But yet what do we do? We do the same thing, don't we? Oh, I'm not very smart. I'm not very good at speaking. I, I don't know the Word of God well enough. I, I don't, I just, that's not, go, go choose someone else, Lord. And be assured, elders, if we had elders, we don't hear, the men may ask you to do something. And your reply may be, nope, go pick somebody else. Brothers and sisters, understand it's not you, it's not me that, that those who do so are rejecting. It is God whom they are rejecting. If I turn down, and I'm not saying, understand this, I'm not saying that you or I as individuals must do everything because we can't. I've learned many lessons over the years serving as a preacher. One of those lessons, a very valuable lesson is I can't do everything. I can't be everywhere. I can't take care of everything and God doesn't expect me to. We see Moses as a great example of that as well, right? Moses finally does go, finally does. Uh, God uses him to deliver the people. And what is he doing? He's judging them and he's doing it from all day long. And what did his father-in-law tell him? Moses, you're going you're gonna to burn out. You need to realize you can't do it all. Well, here's what you need to do. And God assures him, yes, Moses, go do this. Appoint these people. 
And Mo what's Moses to do? Appoint others. They'll handle small things. And if it's a really big, important issue, then the people can come to him. And he'll go to God. But we can't sit around and say, I can't do that. We need to be serving the Lord. And God isn't going to accept it if I'm spending my time making excuses and ultimately coming as Moses does to this point of just saying, pick somebody else, God. God wasn't real happy with Moses. Look, look in chapter 4 and verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. He was mad at Moses about this situation. And here we read how that he he tells him of Aaron. Apparently Moses is familiar with Aaron, knows who he is, knows who he, Moses, is. Remember, he's been brought up with in the house of Pharaoh. But he knew who his family was. He had been raised up to a certain point by his mother. And he, he knew who he was. And here God says, Is not Aaron, uh, uh, Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And he goes on to tell him. Brothers and sisters, understand this. You may say, I can't do these things. But look about you. You have brothers and sisters who can help you. You have brothers and sisters who can strengthen you. We each have our abilities, do we not? Each of us has our strengths. Each of us has our weaknesses. And we can be of assistance one with another. Moses here over and over offers excuses as to why he can't do what God has told him to do. He offers excuse after excuse as to why God is simply mistaken. And that's ultimately what he's getting at, isn't it? God, you don't know. You don't know what you're asking. You don't know who I am. You don't know what you are saying. Doubting God. And brothers and sisters, when you and I do that, we are doing the very same thing. When we offer excuses as to why we can't do what God wants us to do, we are rejecting God. We are failing to be obedient to Him. And we need to recognize that. And just as God is not pleased here with Moses and his excuses, He is not pleased with your excuse or my excuse. We could just as easily look at Adam and Eve. They offered excuses, didn't they? Chapter 3 of Genesis. We know that, that God had told them what to do. Chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And yet, we know that they didn't listen, did they? They didn't obey. We read of that, begin there in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Genesis. And ultimately what happens? God begins to inquire, what is it that you've done? Why have you done this? Eve offers excuse. Well, <laughs> serpent beguiled me. Well, that's true, he did. But that didn't mean she had to listen. What did Adam say? Well, Lord, the woman gave, gave it to me and you gave her to me. So it's her fault for giving it. And by the way, Lord, it's your fault. You shouldn't have given her to me in the first place. He could have said, no, couldn't he? The word clearly indicates he was not fooled. He knew what he was doing. He chose to do it. He could have said no. 
Was God pleased with their excuses? Did he accept their excuses? No, he didn't. Did he hear accept Moses' excuse? Did any of his, these excuses, at any point does he say, you're right, Moses, I'll go pick somebody else. He doesn't, does he? He says, Moses, I know you. I am going to help you. I am with you. I am sending Aaron, your brother. He is able. He can do those things that perhaps you're not the most qualified in. Moses, I've chosen you. Now go do it. Brothers and sisters, you and I may spend our days offering excuses. And God's not going to come. Let us be clear on this. God's not going to appear suddenly to us today or tonight or tomorrow or any time. And, and He's not going to say, Jim, you get up and go do this. He doesn't have to, you see. He's already told Jim and you and me <coughs> here what we are to do. But understand, he didn't accept excuses then. He hasn't accepted excuses, and he's not going to. He's not going to accept your excuses or mine. And we need to simply obey him. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you are... Maybe you are not a Christian. We often make excuses as to why we're not going to obey, don't we? Oh, there's a better time. Oh, people will be uh, laugh at me or reject me or, or I'm going to lose loved ones. Oh, I'm having too much fun. Excuses won't do you any good when you're standing before the Lord unprepared. Don't pass up the opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. And He teaches you what you must do. You must, indeed, you must, Hear the word. Believe in Christ as the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess Him to be the Son of God. And be baptized. Immersed in water for the remission of your sins. If you're here today and have need to do so, don't pass up the opportunity. Or maybe you're a Christian. Maybe something we've looked at today has opened your eyes to something you need to correct. Or maybe something else. Maybe you've got some <coughs> sin in your life that you need to correct. Maybe it's a private matter and you need to go to the Father and ask His forgiveness. He's promised to be to forgive you if you're faithful to confess <coughs> your faults. But maybe you need prayers <coughs> of your brothers and sisters. If you're here and have need, please come while we stand and while we sing. Careless soul, why will you leave?